if truth goes then freedom goes we can know the truth because god has revealed the truth to us use your minds your minds have been given to you to find the truth if america is to return to greatness america has to return to truth Thank you each one for coming. In these uh, seven lectures on Tuesday nights here at Redeemer Lutheran in Fridley, I'm talking about why Christianity lost America and how to return America to greatness. Tonight my theme is returning America to truth. When Harvard University was founded as a college, the goal the motto was veritas truth education was supposed to uh, prepare young people to a pursuit of truth for all of their lives america became a beacon of freedom to the whole world a great nation because america was founded upon truth such as all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights amongst these are life liberty and pursuit of happiness and to ensure uh, these truths uh, these governments are instituted amongst men which derive their just powers from the consent of the govern governed so said the declaration of independence so america was founded on truth and that's why it did become a great nation not many historians admit that india my country exists as a nation free nation because of america as early as 1833 british evangelicals and victorian christians in general were using the success of american revolution as an argument why britain should not keep india as a colony but prepare india for her independence uh, and the success of american revolution was one of their strongest empirical argument although they were inspired by the bible and biblical theology that god's desire is freedom that's 1830 uh, 1830s 38 was when charles trevelyan for example argued that in his book on the education of the people of india in 1940 that's 110 years or so later it was american president franklin roosevelt who persuaded winston churchill not it was not mahatma gandhi but american president who persuaded uh, winston churchill that india should be given the right to self determination according uh, along with all other colonies that they should become free nations so Uh, Roosevelt's role was at least as important as Mahatma Gandhi's role, role in India becoming free. And Roosevelt was not just an individual; he was expressing some of the fundamental assumptions of American civilization. Now, that's a part of history in which I will not go today, uh, but uh, I remind you of that simply to make the point that America was very important for. uh the freedom of the world in 1945 the world did not create after the second world war united empires it created united nations because america was a nation uh forged according to the biblical understanding of what it means to be a nation so america was founded on truth american education and american uh, political system was founded on the foundation of truth and that made america great therefore returning america to greatness means reestablishing the authority of truth in american culture today america's one of america's fundamental problems is that people don't believe in truth a typical high school graduate as he graduates from a high school enters the college or university he believes no one knows the truth no one can know the truth anyone who says i know the truth is a bigoted fundamentalist so 70% of americans particularly amongst the young people 
don't believe that there is anything, any such thing as truth or that it can be known. Now, the tragedy is not that the secular education no longer believes in truth. The tragedy is that Christian education and much of the Christian church in America doesn't believe in truth. My book, which is for sale at the book table at the back, called The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization, was published by uh, Thomas Nelson in 2011. And one Christian university in California immediately picked it up as a textbook. Every uh, individual joining faculty in that university, whether teaching or non-teaching, was required to read the book before they come on duty uh, because this, the university felt, is a book that is integrating Bible with many disciplines of life. It's a true interdisciplinary study of how the Bible has shaped Western civilization. The university also decided that every student who comes to study undergraduate program four years in that university will go through this book. So the professor who was responsible for teaching the book invited me to speak to 100 students in two different classes who were studying this book, the, the book that made your world, how the Bible created the soul of Western civilization. I began both the classes with a very simple question, uh, and I took a lot of time to explain the questions to students so that they knew exactly what I'm asking. I won't take that time because I'm speaking to a maturer audience. My question was that suppose tomorrow you find out that Christianity is not true, that God never became man, that Jesus did not die for our sins, that Jesus never rose again from the dead. Christianity is not true. You have found that out. How many of you would still believe Christianity? About a dozen hands went up in both the classes. And these were beautiful Christians who really loved the Lord, who were committed to the Lord. But their fellow students turned to them aghast, shocked, that you know Christianity is not true, even then you will believe Christianity. So I asked those people who had raised their hand, why would you believe Christianity after you know that it is not true? They said, because justification is by faith alone. Now, they were not Lutherans, they were Baptists, but they were, <laughs> <laughs> they were <laughs> uh, justification is by faith alone. That's the impact of Luther and Lutheranism on the whole world. Now, uh, so, in their minds, these beautiful Christians grew up in Christian homes, went to Sunday school, went to Christian high school, went to Christian university. Some of them were in Christian university for four years. Christianity, Bible-believing, evangelical Christianity, had painted itself, branded itself as the party of faith. Christian school, Christian university, the church exists to cultivate faith. We are not interested in truth. So I asked those students, if Christianity is not about truth, who is for truth? They said, well, it's the secular scientists and the media. They are interested in truth. We are interested in faith, in salvation. So I said, okay, if it is the secular world which is interested in truth, can you name one secular scientist you think knows the truth? And both the classes independently uh, uh, named Stephen Hawking, who had published six months earlier his book on the grand design. In the beginning was black hole, black hole was with gravity, and together black hole and gravity created all this fantastic design. There is a design in the universe, but we don't need a designer to explain that design. Gravity and black hole can explain that design was his argument. So here are beautiful Christian students in a Christian university who believe that Christianity is about faith, it's not about truth. Now that's total contrast to the way, say, the Gospel of John presents uh, Jesus. What is the Jesus brand? John says in chapter 1 uh, of the Gospel of John, verse 17, that law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. 
Truth is a central point of the Gospel of John. In chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. He says, God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in, this, in spirit and in truth. He's alluding to the Ten Commandments, the first two of the Ten Commandments, that you should not make false gods and goddesses because when you make idols, you have to invent myths. You mustn't believe in myths. You must know the truth. You must believe the truth. You must worship truth. Therefore, don't make false gods. Uh, idols and images of worship, anything which is not God is the point of the first two commandments. And Jesus is alluding to this woman who says that our fathers worship here, you worship, you Jews worship in temple. Um, and Jesus is saying, no, you must know the truth, you must believe the truth, you must worship what is truth. He goes on to say in John chapter 8 that if you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Freedom depends on uh, truth having ultimate authority in a culture, in a family, in an uh, organization. And if truth goes, it's freedom that goes. Most of the world doesn't understand freedom, doesn't have freedom because it doesn't have truth. And I'll come back to it in a few minutes. In chapter 14, for example, Jesus says, I am the truth. He says in chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16 of John three times that I will send you the spirit of truth. I have a lot of truth to teach you, but you cannot take all of that truth now. Therefore, I'll send you the Holy Spirit. The, I will send you the spirit of truth. He will lead you into all truth. He will witness his spirit that comes, proceeds from the Father and from the Son. He knows the Father and the Son. Therefore, he will lead you into all truth. As Jesus stands before Pilate in John chapter 18, Pilate asks him, are you then the king of the Jews? Jesus says, yes, for this reason I was born, for this purpose I came, to bear witness to the truth. Whoever is on the side of truth listens to me. Peter dismisses him. What is truth? Goes out to the crowd and says, I find no basis for a charge against this man. He is innocent. The crowd shouts, crucify him, crucify him. He comes back and begins to question again. And Jesus becomes silent. Jesus stops talking to him. And Pilate is puzzled. Why wouldn't you talk to me? Don't you realize that I have the power to crucify you or to set you free? Suppose you are Pilate's wife or his golf buddy and you say to him, wait a minute, you are the chief justice of the Supreme Court of Israel. You just made a public declaration that there is no basis for a charge against this man. This man is innocent. If he is innocent, do you have the power to crucify him? Or is the power given to you to defend the life of an innocent? You have the army at your disposal. What would Pilate say? He would say, oh, you're just a woman, if you happen to be his wife. You don't understand. Now, nobody knows the truth. Nobody can know the truth. Truth is a point of view. His point of view is that he is guilty and should be crucified. Her point of view is that he should be set free because he is a good man. Truth is a point of view. It's all relative. It's true for you. That's true for him. What matters is my point of view. What matters, why does my point of view matter? Because I have the army. I have the sword. Why isn't Pilate interested in truth? Could he have said to Jews, thank you for bringing this guy to me. You know, I've been governor all over. I've been posted all over the Roman Empire. I've never met somebody who knows the truth. Now that you've brought him to me, leave him with uh, me for the weekend. Tomorrow is your Sabbath. You go and observe your Sabbath. Come back. We can hang him on, uh, the, uh, after the weekend. Uh, but let me learn all about truth. Uh, Jews would have probably said, fine. Why wasn't he interested in truth? 
That's because 300 years prior to Pilate, the Greek rationalism had degenerated into skepticism at first, into relative skepticism, doubt, and finally uh, into absolute skepticism um, under the impact of Buddhism. Alexander the Great traveled with uh, some philosophers all the way up to India. He met uh, some of these Buddhist philosophers who were naked, who were making, living in jungles, making Buddha's statues, etc. And as the pyro of Elia, a philosopher who was traveling with Alexander, because Alexander had been trained as a philosopher to be a philosopher king by Aristotle. So he was traveling with philosophers, and as um, he's interacting with uh, Buddhism, Buddhism destroys Greek rationalism that there is no God. Gods and goddesses are myths. They are made up. They're imaginary. There is no God. If there is no God, there is no word in the beginning. There is silence in the beginning, and silence is ignorance. Not uh, Ignorance is the ultimate reality. The Buddha had a technical word for ignorance. He called it avidya, lack of knowledge, ignorance. That is a primeval ignorance which exists from everlasting to everlasting. Everything has come out of ignorance, including the human intellect. Therefore, intellect cannot be a means of knowing truth. If you want to experience enlightenment, you have to empty your mind, or as one of the Hindu gods, Rajneesh, Osho Rajneesh, who had the big ranch in Oregon, he used to say, intellect is the chief villain. You have to kill the intellect. And that's what meditation was all about, how to silence the mind, empty the mind. Uh, in that silence of meditation, you have a mystical experience of altered state of consciousness. Uh, that is what leads you to enlightenment. So the impact of Greek uh, Buddhism on Greek rationalism was to bring an end to Greek rationalism and begin Greek Gnosticism, Greek mysticism, which was called Greek Gnosticism, which doesn't believe that there is a revelation from God or that human mind is made in God's image, therefore the mind can know. So uh, Buddhist, uh, Greek rationalism ended, turned into mysticism, magic, myths. So by the time of Pilate, Greek or Roman civilization was based not on philosophy, not on theology, but on mythology. Paul is encountering unknown gods, false gods and goddesses. Jesus conquers the ancient Greek or Roman civilization, learned civilization, which had had a lot of philosophy, etc., because Jesus and his apostles unleashed the power of truth. Jesus didn't say that when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will become storytellers. He said when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will have power and you will be my witnesses. A witness is a legal term. He is witnessing to what he knows, what the truth. As Peter puts it, that when we came to you, we were determined not to tell stories cleverly crafted by us. We were eyewitnesses. We were there on that majestic mountains. We heard the voice. This is my beloved son, which was God quoting Psalm 2, etc. So John says that we are not writing stories that we have fabricated. We are telling you what we have touched, what we have handled, what we have heard, what we have seen. We are witnesses. We are not myth makers. We are not storytellers. So Jesus unleashes the power of truth. Now go back to that conversation between Jesus and Pilate. Pilate doesn't believe that anybody can know the truth. Because the concept of truth only makes sense if there is someone who knows. Someone who is gracious and kind enough to communicate truth to us if there is a revelation. If word has existed from ever, word created this universe, and word communicates truth to us, if words actually are means of communicating truth rather than manipulating each other as postmodern 
deconstructionist mindset would say that words are tools we use to manipulate each other. They have nothing to do with truth. Truth is a part of a biblical worldview. Once that worldview goes, the word truth has no meaning except as a manipulative term that I am trying to persuade you to follow me because I claim to be truth, whereas actually nobody knows the truth, nobody can know the truth, nobody is interested in truth. Uh, truth is only a manipulation of each other, which is what the Western University is now teaching. But if truth goes, then freedom goes. The point of the Declaration of Independence is that all men are created equal. We have slaves. We do practice racism. We don't like worshipping with those guys there. But nevertheless, the truth is that all men are created equal. We are all descended of one parents. Eve became the mother of all the living. We are all sinners. We are all saved by grace. We all become priests by, by receiving the Holy Spirit, etc. If that's the truth, that each one, when it says that you shall not kill, it means that you will not kill people of another race or another tribe or another tongue or another religion because they have an inalienable right to life which the command you shall not kill gives them the right. The command you shall not steal gives them the right to property that they cannot be deprived of their property unjustly without the due process of law. That's where fundamental rights come from. And these rights are endowed by their creator. He doesn't want you to covet their property, their wife, their house, their vineyard, steal it, because he wants them to have happiness. That's why he put man in Eden. Eden means bliss. So this whole concept of these inalienable rights Jefferson understood correctly comes from the Creator. But today, it makes no sense to a high school graduate because he thinks he knows perfectly well that God never created human beings. We have evolved. And evolution doesn't endow equality. Evolution ensures inequality. So the Declaration of Independence is a myth as far as this high school graduate is concerned. America is founded on a myth. Good myth, but nevertheless a myth. Now, it so happens that in fact the Declaration of Independence did begin a very important, very foundational myth of America, which has now collapsed, as it should have collapsed right at the outset from the beginning. The part that all men are created equal, are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable right, is correct. But the part that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that is myth. Equality is not self-evident. Inequality is self-evident. No two, two people are equal. No two uh, snowflakes are equal. Inequality is observable everywhere. Equality is not an observable scientific truth. It's a theological truth which ought to transform society, but it's not an observable truth. And Thomas Jefferson knew this. Therefore, in the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, all you have to do is just Google the original draft of the Independence, Declaration of Independence. It will come up on your cell phone, iPhone, or whatever, iPad. He wrote, we hold these truths to be sacred, meaning revealed in sacred scriptures, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That's what Jefferson wrote. Under pressure from Benjamin Franklin and other days, he changed the word sacred to self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident, meaning that we know these truths through common sense, not through revelation. 
Now, that was a myth. America's tragedy is that the Bible-believing church, Protestant church, went along with this myth, and the reason the Bible-believing church accepted America's foundational myth was because this myth was invented in Scottish Enlightenment by a Christian apologist, Thomas Reed. Thomas Reed was responding to David Hume. Hume was a rationalist, and on the basis of logic, Hume argued that logic cannot prove God, logic cannot prove science, because logic cannot prove causation. You can't prove that every, every effect has to have a cause. You see the fire, you see the smoke, but you assume that the smoke is caused by fire, but you can't actually prove that the smoke is caused by the fire. Um, sort of thing. He was arguing that causation cannot be proved, therefore uh, God cannot be proved, and science cannot be proved. Uh, you believe that water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius everywhere in the cosmos under the same uh, atmospheric pressure, etc., same physical conditions. That's an assumption nobody can go everywhere in the universe to actually prove. You know, if you've seen James Cameron film Avatar, uh, that's the correct Indian pronunciation of Avatar. Um, <laughs> Avatar means incarnation. Uh, the action is happening on a moon called Pandora, and if you've seen the movie, you know that on Pandora, the mountains hang upside down. Why? Because Cameron is saying Pandora is a goddess, like Earth is a goddess. We should worship the Earth. Well, if Pandora is a goddess, Pandora can decide that my cousin Earth, the Gaia, works on gravity, so I'm going to work on anti-gravity and mountains will hang upside down. If Saturn is a god, and Indians worship Saturn as a god, then Saturn is free to decide that here water will not boil at 100 degrees Celsius, it will freeze at 100 degrees Celsius. And it will boil at minus four. So Minnesota will boil in winter. <laughs> uh, Saturn can decide that if it is God. Now you believe that water will actually boil at 100 degrees Celsius everywhere in the universe because you believe that one creator, one logos has created the entire cosmos and sustains the entire cosmos. Even if you say, no, no, I'm not a Christian, I don't believe that. I believe in Big Bang Theory. Well, good for you. Big Bang Theory is only secularization of biblical worldview. Okay, there was a Big Bang which created this universe. Could there have been a few smaller bangs? Could there have been a couple of bigger bangs? Why do you believe that there is only one Big Bang and only one cosmos which runs on one set of laws? If these bangs keep happening in the universe, why can't there be multiverse? What you're looking, uh, you're looking at out there is multiverse which is running at multiple laws. That the whole cosmos is running and with one set of laws is a theological assumption, even if you call yourself an atheist, who believes in Big Bang, Big Bang as the beginning of the universe, etc. So this is the sort of argument which Hume is making, and in order to save God from Hume's legitimate rationalistic attack on um, uh, Christian apologetics, Christian philosophers, David uh, Thomas Reed invents the theory of common sense. So because a Scottish apologist had invented the myth of common sense. American church believed that myth, and American Christian colleges taught that myth. The only dissenting voices were few theologians who took the doctrine of total depravity seriously. That no, Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 1, that the wise men of this earth with their wisdom did not know God, could not know God. That's why God revealed himself through the gospel of grace.
through the cross of Christ. And that's what Romans 1 is, is saying, if you read Romans 1 in the light of 1 Corinthians 1, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God because the wrath of God is upon the men of common sense who instead of worshiping the creator, worship the creation. And they become so perverted in their minds, deluded in their thinking that they get into all sorts of uh, secu sexual perversion and corruption which soon destroys the families, uh, which is the most m important instrument of moralizing and then you have a whole generation coming up which doesn't know what is right and what is wrong. So, point of Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 1 is that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of common men, whereas America was teaching for 200 years that common sense can lead us to truth. It's common sense that we shouldn't commit adultery and that we shouldn't uh, covet our neighbor's wife, etc. Now, none of that is common sense today. I was uh, with, a Christ with a family, not a Christian family, a secular family, about 15 years ago, could have been 13 years ago, uh, in Chicago. Uh, the father is a brilliant neurosurgeon. He was having a good debate with his daughters, college-going daughters. The father was arguing that, look, it is common sense that marriage should be between a man and a woman. The daughters were saying, Daddy, you are a bigot, a secular bigot. Marriage should be between two lovers. What has gender got to do with it? If two men love each other or two women love each other, they should be free to marry. Now, this is a discussion happening, happening 13 years ago. And the daughters were appealing to common sense, that this is common sense that two lovers should be able to marry. So common sense is a myth because common sense is a shadow. America's tragedy is that as Michael Novak, a Roman Catholic scholar, published in his book, On Two Wings, Humble Faith and Common Sense at America's Founding, Novak's thesis is that the American eagle flew past all other civilizations and became the greatest civilization, greatest nation on earth in history because the American eagle flew on two wings, Protestant faith in the Bible and common sense. He's right. That's what happened. Common sense was very important, and common sense was taught by Christian colleges, Christian textbooks, as America's philosophy. But the common sense party, the deists, the uni uh, universalists, the Unitarians, etc., skeptics, they took over Christian educational institutions. In 1839, there were 54 colleges in America. 51 of them had Protestant clergy, ordained clergymen as presidents. All the institutions were started by uh, Christian churches. So the Common Sense Party, the Enlightenment Party, took over the in educational institutions which the church had established and use those institutions to clip the first wing of the American eagle. The Bible is a myth, the Bible is a myth, the Bible is a myth. The reality was that the Bible was reality, common sense was a shadow. So Jefferson's common sense, or Thomas Paine's com common sense, or Benjamin Franklin's common sense is only a shadow of the Bible. I was just reading uh, Thomas Paine's Common Sense yesterday on my iPad, and I was reminded powerfully when he answers the question, okay, so we can have a constituent assembly, we can have elected representatives, senators, etc., but where is our king? He quotes um, an Italian uh, author who says that, well, this author is in turn quoting Samuel Rutherford's Rex Lex, but uh, Thomas Paine doesn't mention that, but this uh, Italian author, uh, Paine is quoting, says, we do have a king, law, in despotic, monarchical uh, countries such as Britain under King George. King is the law. 
Whereas in America, law will be the king. Law is king. That was Rutherford's Rex Lex. Law is king. So this Italian author, quoting, uh, Payne quoting this fellow, uh, what is Donetti? Um, yeah, he says that yes, we should have a king's crown. We should put it in the Bi on the Bible because our law should come out of the word of God. That's why the president of America puts his hand on the Bible to take his oath of office. The law coming from God is the king. Therefore, we shall not be ruled by kings. We will be ruled by law. Now, that's a biblical worldview. So the common sense of Thomas Paine is a shadow of the Bible. He rejects the Bible. He, in his age of reason, he launches America's first major attack on the Bible. So the common sense party takes Christian institutions, captures Christian institutions, and clips off the first wing of American Eagle, which is Protestant faith in the Bible. That's gone. That's why common sense collapses, and common sense has collapsed in America. Common sense doesn't lead people to God. It doesn't lead people to morality. It doesn't lead, it cannot even define what marriage is, what love is, what sexuality is all about. So common sense is hopeless. It leads to perversion and foolishness and futility of thinking. That was a myth which American pastors and American colleges and American high schools had taught. The person who really destroyed the metaphysical foundation of America's faith and common sense is Sigmund Freud. Freud is an atheist, a Jewish atheist. He's analyzing dreams. He's analyzing patients under hypnosis, he's analyzing psychosomatic diseases, etc., and raising the question, what is uh, consciousness? And he comes to the conclusion that consciousness is uh, the tip of the iceberg of the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind is the reality. And the unconscious mind is not rational, it's not logical. It is driven by instincts and lusts and fears and phobias and unfulfilled desires. So our reasoning, our conscious reasoning, the common sense, is in fact rationalization of the irrational unconsciousness. Earlier faith that common sense would lead us to truth rested on theological assumptions that creator is rational, he's logos, he's logical. He made the universe with his wisdom, with his intelligence, therefore universe is rational and logical. He made us in his image so our minds are rational like his mind, and our minds correspond to the way the universe is built, both physically and morally and spiritually, and therefore our minds and our language can actually comprehend truth and communicate truth. These were all biblical theological assumptions. But if the mind is outcome of irrational unconscious mind, then mind can have nothing to do with truth. Reasoning is only rationalization of what I desire, how I want to manipulate you. So Sigmund Freud, his psychoanalysis, destroyed the metaphysical foundation of belief in common sense, that common sense can lead us to truth, that common sense is about truth. His disciple, Carl Jung, went deeper and began to try and understand human society and came to a collective unconscious the idea of collective unconscious, which is very close to the Hindu idea of Brahma, and I won't go into that detail right now. Uh, the important person was impacted both by Freud, but more by Jung, uh, was Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell started writing, he was the experts on myth, global mythology. Since no one knows the truth, since no one can know the truth, since mind is not an instrument of knowing truth, but there are certain commonalities in all cultures, in all of history, in all of mythology. So myth or story is all that we have. All world religions and all philosophies were stories, were mythologies. So we can't really have theology, we can only have mythology. 
Those myths were great. The myth of the Bible, creation, Adam and Eve, fall, for flood, and Jesus coming and dying and resurrection, all of these were good myths for their day. But now we live in a different age. We have different issues. We need fresh myths, and Hollywood should create new myths for our age. Now, with Bill Moyer, for the older people here would know him. He was a PBS journalist. Uh, Joseph Campbell made a television series called The Power of Myth. Bill Moyer and Campbell, that was one of the last things he did. And this uh, television series was filmed in George Lucas's ranch in California called Skywalker Ranch. It was published as Power of Myth, many different versions. It was on PBS. Uh, that all that we have is myth. So George Lucas in his Star Wars is trying to create a myth. That's what um, Dan Brown is doing with Da Vinci Code. That's what Spielberg is doing in some of his films. That's what now James Cameron is doing in this Avatar series. Number two is coming in December 2014. Number three is coming in December 2015 uh, to teach a new myth about nature worship to America and to the world, etc., which is exactly Romans 1. So what has happened to America is that American confidence in truth collapsed. Secularism doesn't believe in truth. It cannot believe in truth because it doesn't believe that there is someone out there who knows the truth and he created us in his image so that he can communicate truth to, to us. So secularism has no use for truth. Evangelicalism gave up truth in favor of faith because it misunderstood Luther, it misunderstood Reformation. The Reformation did talk, talk salvation by faith alone. It didn't say salvation by uh, um, faith and truth because Catholics and Protestants agreed that Christianity is about truth, we must believe that which is truth, there was no dispute over truth, therefore, the slogan such as justification by truth alone never uh, became part of the Reformation tradition. But it, because it, it didn't become part of our slogan, it doesn't mean that truth was not important. The whole fight was about truth. What is truth? How do we know truth? Is it the church that tells us what the truth is? or God's revelation in the Bible that tells us what truth is. Reformers are saying because the Bible is God's word, and the Catholic Church was saying that for a thousand years. The Bible became the cultural authority of the West because thanks to the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has been saying for a thousand years that the Bible is the word of God. And the Reformers agreed with the Catholic Church on that point. Luther's point is that you are saying the Bible is the word of God. That is correct. If that is so, then Bible's authority must supersede the Pope's authority and the church's authority. That was the conflict. So, yes, we can know the truth. Both Catholic and Protestants agreed. Truth, we can know the truth because God has revealed the truth to us. Christianity is about truth. Christ is about truth. Our tragedy is that we sing amazing grace. We have no hymn, amazing truth, wonderful truth. So we branded ourselves as the party of faith, left the truth for Stephen Hawking and the secular scientists who on principle don't believe in truth and can't believe in truth. So truth has disappeared. It's, it's not going to be sufficient that the educational proposal that we have is that every church should double up as college classroom. Students should enroll in an accredited university, let's say Concordia University, but should come to the local church and meet with their professors, listen to the professor online. It's little screens, big screens. Classes should happen in the church, uh, and the best curriculum should come. We should create the world's best curriculum upload it for absolutely free like Wikipedia so anyone can access what we are teaching in the university. Uh, students shouldn't have to pay anything for the content of education. They will have to pay for the delivery of that content for examination, tests, degrees, etc. But that 
edu new, new education delivery system, which is what we are laying the groundwork for during these next, the next two months, May and June here in Minnesota, is not sufficient. What exactly are we educating? And we cannot leave this content of uh, education in the hands of uh, Christian colleges and uh, experts in America because Christian colleges no longer believe in truth. Christian missions no longer believe in truth. Story is what the American evangelical church is now talking about. You don't hear the phrase the gospel truth. Everybody is talking about the gospel story, the Bible story. But none, no American theologian, and here is one of my 95 theses being nailed uh, the door of the American church. I don't know any American theologian who has the humility and integrity to open up a dictionary to see the difference between story and parable. The English Bible uses story for a narrative only once. If that is if a Bible has been translated more than 15 years ago. Only in Matthew 28, when the Jews give some money to the guards and say to the guards that if anybody asks you what happens to the body, you say that when we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. And this story has circulated amongst the Jews till this day, Matthew writes. That's the only time the word story is used. All the storying movement in America says, because Jesus told parables, therefore we should tell stories. And there is no American theologian who has the humility to open up the dictionary and see the difference between parable and story. A parable is not a story. The parable is the opposite of story. Story is intended to bypass the mind, appeal to the emotion. A parable is there to provoke thinking, investigation, what exactly does he mean? Now that leads me to another very important point. Uh, lots of people today talking about biblical worldview. That's become a cliche. I attended a biblical worldview seminar for the weekend, so I know all about it now. <laughs> well, the whole worldview movement is going seriously wrong because... The Bible does not actually say that you know the truth by reading the Bible. So I know John 8, but that's not what Jesus is saying. The modern educational industry, the university system was built up because people like Comenius and Francis Bacon understood that God has written two books, not one book. There is the book of his words, and there is the book of his works, Nature, culture, history. And the Bible is asking us to study both God's words and God's works. The Bible is saying that throughout. So one of the things Francis Bacon really hammers on is Jesus' conversation with the Sadducees. Sadducee says, here is a, this woman, she was married to seven brothers, all eight of them died without a child. Whose wife will she be at the resurrection? Jesus says, you are in error because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. What is the power of God? Works of God. Heavens declare the glory of God. If you want to know the truth, you've got to read the word of God and the works of God because God has written two books. Now, Jesus says that repeatedly. He says, you search the scriptures, they point to me. You sent inquirers to John the Baptist, he witnessed about me. But I have greater testimony than John the Baptist, and these are my works. Believe in me because of my works. What does that mean? When Jesus says, believe in me because of my works, he's saying, use your brains. I had only five loaves and two fish, and I fed 5,000. Who am I? I walked on water. I stilled the storm. You were there, or your representatives were there. When I said, Lazarus, come out, a man dead for four days comes out. Whose word is that? Who am I? Believe in me because of my works. The Old Testament throughout says, Psalm 111, verse 2, for example, 
Majestic are the works of the Lord. Those who delight in them, ponder over them. Now that's a verse written on the entrance of the first scientific lab built in history in Cambridge, uh, Cavendish Laboratory. The entrance has Psalm 111 verse 2. Majestic are the works of the Lord. Those who delight in them, ponder over them, study them. So these scientific labs are built, as Francis Bacon has been arguing, uh, Comenius and others have been arguing, because Christians are to study the works of the Lord. So we are to study both the word and the works. But, and here is a very important point, where biblical worldview movement is going wrong. Scriptures does no, do not say that the words of God and the works of God only reveal truth. God reveals truth, yes. But God also conceals truth. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 25, 2. The glory of God is to conceal a matter. The glory of kings is to find it out. That's why you need research universities where people will find out things that were concealed from scientists, from theologians who were pouring their lives into studying the Word of God, things were still concealed, and therefore you need research university, and America does not have one single Christian research university. That's why American Christian education has not produced a Nobel Prize winner you know, during the last hundred years or so since the Nobel Prize has been around. Uh, because we don't have a research university, but the glory of God is to conceal a matter. Now think of the parables of Jesus, Matthew 13, about uh, the parables about the kingdom of God. Jesus tells the parable of the sower. The kingdom of God is like a sower. He sows the seed, and some seed falls here and there, etc. Dis disciples, uh, especially after the second parable, uh, uh, disciples come to him. They're frustrated that you are a very bad communicator. You tell these parables. Nobody understands what you're talking about. Why do you tell them in par talk to them in parables? Well, Jesus says, because I'm God. The glory of God is to conceal the matter. It's your job to find out. Think about what I have said. Connect the dots. Talk to each other. Search the scriptures. Use your minds. Your minds have been given you, given to you to find the truth. So the purpose of education is not indoctrination, brainwashing. Christian education is not about brainwashing. It is about seeking truth. Your mind is made in God's image. It's a talent given to you. You have to multiply that talent. And that's what a homeschooling mom, that's what a Sunday school teacher is doing. That's what a Christian high school ought to be doing and a Christian college ought to be doing and was doing. And that's why the Western civilization produced all of this phenomenal research and development and advancement of thinking, which once we made the purpose of education to cultivate faith, not cultivate mind and pursuit of truth, uh, we lost some of the tremendous heritage as anti-intellectualism developed in Christian seminaries and in Christian universities. Now, this is not obviously an exhaustive um, uh, study of the themes that I'm proposing today, but let me begin to move towards conclusion, we will be uploading these lectures on YouTube, and then the questions that we are not able to adequately answer today. We will continue a dialogue because we want to invite the global conversation on this, uh, since I'm not just speaking to you, I'm speaking to uh, professors in Christian colleges and universities, and I'm speaking to the Muslims and Hindus and secularists. Today, I'm saying that America became a great nation because American education was pursuing truth. American political system was making, giving ultimate authority in the culture to truth. America went wrong at its founding itself in not acknowledging revelation at the source of truth, but making common sense the source of truth. 
I will come back to take another two, three minutes on that point, but let me uh, uh, summarize what I've said so far. That if America is to return to greatness, America is to return to freedom, America has to return to truth, which means American education once again has to become pursuit of truth. Do we want great financial managers, great engineers, great scientists, great nurses, and great doctors, and great surgeons? Yes. We want to cultivate the mind. But the overall purpose of education is not to help students make money. The purpose of education is pursuit of truth, pursuit of character, pursuit of God, pursuit of good citizenship, etc. But since I used uh, Jefferson's preamble to the Declaration of Independence, let me just make a point which is uh, f completely forgotten or mostly forgotten in America because the church has handed over history to the secularists. When Jefferson's right, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and both the Christians and the deists agreed with that. Why does America believe that all men are created equal? No Hindu sage ever in history saw all human beings as equal, male and female as equal. Inequality was self-evident. The real question before the philosophers was, why are human beings unequal? And Hinduism gave two different answers. One was that God created us unequal. The Brahmins, the priestly class, he created with his head, and the servant class he created from his feet, etc. That God has created people unequal. But, okay, Brahmins came, all came out of his mouth, but Brahmins themselves are unequal from each other. Why are they unequal? That's where the theory of karma and reincarnation came in that people are un born unequal because of their poor karma or good karma in previous lives. So creation and karma and reincarnation were philosophical explanations for self-evident inequality. Why was human equality evident to founders, American founders, even though there was already slavery and racism here? The reason it was self-evident was that in 1730s, George Whitfield became the first white man to start pre preaching to the blacks in America. And that upset a lot of white people. That, Do you really want us to be drinking Holy Communion in the same cups as these um, uh, people? We can't do that. So he had to start defending himself. Why am I preaching to the blacks? And by 1740, he started writing uh, regularly on uh, that all men are created equal or, or have the immortal souls. Uh, Jesus loved all of them. He died for all of them. They all have to be saved. And we all become brothers and sisters, members of one another, one body, uh, one church, etc. Uh, so he began writing this in 1740. So it was the writings of George Whitfield which created the consensus, which is exposition of the Bible, which created the consensus which all American founders of the uh, American nation had no problem in signing that we hold these truths to be sacred, that all men are created equal. So that truth didn't come from scientific sociological observation that all men are created equal, taught by uh, common sense. That truth, truth came from the Bible. But Bible being studied systematically and things that are hidden are being researched and understood and applied to society. So it was equality was a truth which was not an empirical, sociological, observable truth, but a theological truth which ought, needed to transform society. And that transformation took a century before uh, slavery was abolished, a war had to be fought, lots of blood had to be shed uh, on the basis of um, things like Uncle Tom's cabin, etc. And the truth began to be applied, both by the writers and by the fighters. But then another uh, revolution had to come uh, with uh, the, um, led by Martin Luther King Jr., etc., 
who was an ordained clergyman and a great expositor of the Bible. Uh, if you haven't heard his expositions of the Bible, you should hear his tapes. But let me wind up. Yes, America was founded on truth, but that truth came from the Bible. This was reality. Common sense was a shadow. For 200 years, common sense agreed with the Bible because the Bible, through the pulpit, through this Christian school and Christian universe, universities, was shaping the common sense of those Americans who actually personally didn't believe in the Bible. Their common sense was shaped by the Bible. But now when the Bible was dismissed as myth or story, common sense has collapsed. So the American eagle is now without both its wings, and that's why it's in free fall. So how do we return America to greatness? We have to bring education back to Veritas. The purpose of education should once again become pursuit of truth. Both the truth revealed in the, word, uh, the book of God's words and the book of God's works, and the, book, uh, the, the truth concealed by God, so that we research, we find, we cultivate our mind, and we discover truth for His glory. How is this to be done? For a number of reasons, which we might take up during our convers uh, conversation, uh, Q&A, uh, this oh, I'm proposing that we turn every church into college classroom Monday to Friday, have an academic pastor mentoring 10 to 15 students, curriculum comes online, students go to colleges for practicals and things that cannot be done in the church, they take their uh, tests and assessment, and then they get their degrees. Universities continue. Universities, in fact, make more money because now instead of having 4,000 students, they can have 40,000 or 400,000 students, charge much less. They give, get more, the professors get more leisure because they don't have to repeat the same lecture every, every year. So the Christian universities and colleges can actually become research universities where professors are uh, and the PhD students and graduate students are intellectual communities sharpening each other, studying each other, and you have um, first-rate scholars coming out who are not following uh, the world, but then the world can begin to look up to them because he, here are people who are uh, using uh, cultivating their own minds. So that, that's the proposal. Uh, I'll stop here. We'll have five minutes break, and um, with, um, Pastor Dave will come up and make some announcements, and then we'll take Q&A. Thank you. If truth goes, then freedom goes. We can know the truth because God has revealed the truth to us. Use your mind. Your minds have been given to you find the truth. If America is to return to greatness, America has to return to truth. 